Okay. Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Alan Woodward. Uh, I work with Flax, which is a search consultancy based in Cambridge in the UK. Um, I'm a Lucene Seller committer. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you today about turning search upside down, uh, which is kind of nonsensical. <clears throat> so what does that actually mean? So the use cases that we are we're using, or that we're, we're looking at, are circumstances where you have lots and lots and lots of queries, and you want to run these queries over a stream of documents. So in our use case, it's for clippings companies, it's for media monitoring. Um, but you could also use it for things like tagging or classification. Um, so what you want to do is you have your big set of stored queries. For media monitoring in particular, what you want to do is uh, you want to identify media stories that are of interest to your client. So you will create a large query which um, says, OK, if you have any of these terms in this document that I'm interested in it, I want to find out about it. Um, so you have various different, things, there are various different bits of information that you want from these uh, uh, these queries, you can say either I just want to know if this query matches or not. So if you're tagging, for example, um, you've got a big query that says anything that matches this query should be tagged with this term. So you're just going to say I just want to know if it matches or not. Um, you might want scoring information. Uh, you might want exact match position information. You want to say, okay, I've got this query. I want to know the exact bits of this document that match this query. How are we going to do that? Well, the easy answer is you use uh, the memory index, which is something, a, uh, uh, an object in Lucene, um, which is a, an index for a single document. Uh, and then you can get your, so you index your document, and then you get your any number of queries, and you run all those queries against that document, and you pull the results out, and you, you respond. Um, which is fine. It works. And you kind of one problem with it, which is, that it's very slow. Um, we're talking about very, very large queries. Uh, these are very complex queries. Um, really, very, very big. I should point out this isn't actually a real query because uh, the queries are kind of governed by um, our clients are quite protected of their queries, so this is a made-up one. But anyway, it gives you an idea of quite how big we're talking about. And it's not just the size of them, it's what they consist of. They are very ugly queries. These are not queries that are written by people who are coders. They're not generally written by, certainly not written by people who understand how search engines work. So you'll have lots of wildcards everywhere. You'll have people putting the same term in with different capitalizations. Uh, you'll get wildcards put at the end and at the beginning of terms, even though that kills performance. Um, you get people don't don't really understand how stemming works, so they'll stick a wildcard in the end to uh, to uh, get all forms of a word, even though there's already stemming built in there. You'll get people who uh, it didn't work when you put it in once. Maybe we put it in the query twice. That'll work. So these are enormous queries. They have lots and lots of wildcards in them, which means that if you're running one of these queries against, so running every single one of these queries against each document, every one of those queries has to be rewritten for that document, which takes time. So a typical document that passes through, this is um, so a client that we've just built this for. You've got about 20,000 queries, and the typical document that goes through will match maybe two. That's 19,998. I got it 99 there for some reason. Um, the, the queries there which you're running for no reason whatsoever. They're just taking up time. And we want to be able to reduce the amount of time that these useless queries uh, take, preferably to zero milliseconds. Uh, and the best way to reduce the amount of time um, that a query takes is to not run it at all in the first case. So what we want to do is we want to pre-select the queries that we think are likely to get a hit, and we want to filter out those queries that we know aren't going to get a hit. It's just kind of like a search. Okay? You've got a space of queries, and you want to search those queries with your document. It's a backward search. Uh, and yes, and the aim is to get as few false positives as possible. So we want to really restrict the number of queries we're running. You want to really only run ones that, are, that have a very decent chance of hitting. But you want zero false negatives. You don't want to miss out any of those queries that might have got a hit. Because if you do that, then you've got, you're getting inaccurate results. And particularly in the case of media monitoring, where 
you know, there's, there's quite a lot of competition there. If someone says, you know, if your client comes along and says, this particular article came in that mentioned my name and you missed it, why am I paying you this amount of money to do this? I'm going to go to your competitor. So it's very important that we get no false negatives, that we actually retrieve every, we run every query that could possibly get a hit. So what we've done is at Flax, we've built a Java library called Luwak, which does just this. It stores um, a whole bag of, uh, of Lucene queries. Um, you register them with, your, with the monitor. It stores them in an internal index. When a document comes into the monitor, that document is then converted into a query, which is run over that internal index. And that selects which of those stored queries to run. It then runs those queries and gives you, uh, gives you your results back from the queries that it has selected to run. This is all pluggable. Um, there is something called a pre-searcher which deals with translating the queries into terms that can be indexed and translates the document into something that could be queried. Uh, and then the match reporting as well is all pluggable. So you can say, I just want to know, you know, is it a match or not? I want to know the score. There are different matches that you pass to it. How does it work? Um, so we index queries by having uh, a bunch of things called extractors, uh, which are parameterized by the query. Um, you can have, so again, these are pluggable, so you can put in your own, if you have your own queries, then you can have put your own way of uh, extracting terms from them. Um, the term query is very easy. We just say, okay, we well, just pull the term out. Numeric queries are term queries as well underneath, so again, just pull the term out. Um, and a Boolean query, a Boolean, you can think of a Boolean query as a kind of tree. Um, and we recurse through that query tree and we pull out all the terms that we find within that query tree and we index those. We can be a bit cleverer about how we do that. Ideally, you want to be indexing as few terms as possible from a query because you want to only hit... Um, the more terms you index, the more likely it is that, that query is going to get hit by a, any document that's coming in. Um, so if you can if you can reduce the number of terms that you're indexing under, then you're going to reduce the number of times it gets hit by a document. So how can we do that? Well, we can say, obviously, any must not clause in a Boolean query, you know, don't care about that. Um, if, if it's a disjunction, if it's just got should and must not queries, then you do have to index all the various uh, subclauses, also all the, all the should clauses. But if there are any must clauses in there, if it's a conjunction of any kind, then you can ignore everything else, and you can say, all right, I just want to, I just need to index one of those conjunction terms. Because every single one of these terms has to be present in a document for it to actually get a hit when you, when you run a query over it, you can say, okay, I only need one. Which means that we, can, we have a bit of leeway in how we decide which of these terms to index. Um, you can say, okay, how do we do it? Well, longer terms tend to be rarer. So a term like the or der is going to be hit in every single document. You don't really want to do that. But a, a, a longer term, like Jabberwock, for example, is going to be fairly unusual. So that's a better term to index. That's going to hit you know, any document that comes in with Jabberwock, and it needs to hit that one. But anything else that has the in it is not going to match. So we can ignore that one. Um, when, you're do, when you're recursing through the, the query tree, uh, you, can, you might have um, some clauses that actually have quite a lot of terms underneath them. So you've got a should clause that has a bunch of other uh, should clauses underneath it. So you've got lots of terms there. On the other hand, you've got uh, a should clause that, sorry, you've got a must clause that has lots of uh, should clauses underneath it. On the other hand, you've got a must clause that's got just one term underneath it. Then, okay, that's, you'll tend to prefer the one with just a single term because, again, that's fewer terms to index and you're less likely to hit. But there are fields that you want to avoid. So, for example, if you've got um, quite a lot of the queries we, we have are of the form category X and massive great query. And if you're being naive about it, um, then you're going to say, okay, well, the category X is actually, that's the shorter term, so let's just index that. But it turns out that the category is something that is, has very low cardinality. Um, and so, say, 50% of your documents coming through have category X. They're all going to get run. All those queries that are indexed under that are going to get run. Um, and in fact, we did, 
I came across this um, for a client that I'm just working on now, where we found that we were we were really not cutting out very many queries, and this was because it was using this naive, oh, okay, there are fewer terms in this uh, conjunction clause than in this one, so let's index everything under here, and it ended up indexing a really, really common term. Um, so we do this, the, we have something called a term waiter, uh, which will, it takes as input all these various different subclauses, um, and it runs uh, a number of, thing, uh, a number of um, rules over those subclauses, and gets a score out, and the one with the best score is indexed. And again, this is pluggable, so you can, you can tune it. A lot of this stuff is, um, it depends very much on your corpus of queries and on your corpus of documents. So we can't say, X is going to work for everything. Yeah, actually, in some, some cases, well, these fields are better in these use cases, these fields are better in these use cases. So you need to tune it for, uh, for your use case and for your set of documents and for your set of queries. More complex queries, things like proximity queries and phrase queries, um, you can just treat them as conjunctions. So again, you just need a single term out of the phrase and it runs to the term waiter and it chooses that best term. So again, a phrase like the Jabberwock, you're going to index Jabberwock. Um, wildcards are fun. You saw in the, the query earlier that we had lots of things with wildcards. You had prefix wildcards and suffix wildcards. How can you index something that is going to hit, the, that's gonna hit, the, hit the, the bit of the wildcard that you're interested in? What we do is, well, there, there's actually two ways of doing it. Um, you can do it by the, you can extract the longest invariant substring. So if you've got a wildcard that's got an asterisk at the beginning and an asterisk at the end, you say, okay, we'll take the bit in the middle and we'll index that. And then at document time, when you're building your query out of the document, as well as taking all the terms from that document, you take all the engrams of all the terms from that document as well. So you have the, the, you're going to match any substrings from the terms in the document. Um, or you can, you can do, you can say, well, actually, we're not going to be able to, we can't get anything useful out of this wildcard theory, the wildcard query. We're going to index it under a special token called an any token, uh, which means that uh, all documents are going to match against this query. Thing is that normally this will appear within a conjunction somewhere. So the term waiter is going to chuck out any tokens um, in preference. To, it's going to select any other term in preference to an any token. So quite often you'll find that even if you've got something with loads and loads of wildcards in it, none of those wildcard terms actually get indexed. They get thrown out by the term waiter. Again, it depends on your, um, your documents. It depends on your query set. All these things need to be measured and experimented with. So on the other side, how do you take this, um, your input document and turn it into a query? You've got this query index. You have a bunch of queries which are indexed with, against their individual terms. And you need to now work out which of those queries are likely to match the document that's coming in. So the simple answer is you take your document, you run it through your analyzer, you pull out all the terms from that document, and you make a massive great disjunction query and run that against the query index. And everything that matches is something that it's likely to hit. So you, you have a specialized collector, which you, um, so each, each query that generates a hit, you then pull that query out and run it against the document. Um, we can, you can be fairly efficient about this um, in terms of generating the, uh, the, or the we're pulling all the terms out of the document because the document is already going through analysis in order to be searchable. You're creating your memory index that memory index will have a terms enum, so you can just iterate through that and pull out all the terms, build that into your disjunction query. Um, if you have wildcard queries there, then you can run that through, through the n-gram filter, so you're pulling out all the substrings of all the terms as well. Um, obviously, then you also need to deduplicate it, because otherwise, you know, subsequent terms may have, they share lots of their uh, substrings, and you end up with a disjunction, otherwise you end up with a disjunction query that's actually got lots and lots of the same um, uh, duplicate clauses in there, so we run a, we put a deduplicate, deduplicating uh, token filter on there, um, and we also need to be careful about the the maximum length of terms. We had um, so I had one particular document which was coming through and killing everything and just causing out of memory errors and slowing it all down. I'm trying to work out what was happening. It turned out it actually contained a base64 encoded image, uh, which was you know. 64k of text with no spaces in it, and it was going into the, the n-gram filter, which was then dutifully creating all possible substrings of this 64k long um, uh, string. So yeah, we, you, you put a maximum on there. The interesting thing about putting the maximum on, of course, is that 
what that maximum should be depends on what language you're using, because in something like English, you can put it about 15 terms, and that's going to cover the vast majority. If you're doing it in German, Germans like their really, really long words. Uh, so you need to put it a bit bigger for, for different languages. Um, this was, in fact, for Danish, which I don't speak at all. Uh, so it's been quite interesting working with lots of Danish language stuff and people coming up and saying, this, this clearly doesn't match. And I have to say, doesn't it? I, I, I don't know. You tell me. Um, and the other thing you can do is when you've got this, you know, obviously running a very, a very large disjunction query over um, something, over your query index, if you have lots of terms in there that aren't going to match anything, that's still a bit of a waste. Each one of these still has to, you know, has to pull the terms in um, and, uh, and create a scorer, uh, although lots of those scorers will be null. So in order to cut that down, we can actually we create a token filter that's based on the terms in um of the memory index and strip out anything that's, any of the terms in the document generated by this that aren't are not going to match anything because they don't exist in the, in the um, query index as well. So it's another way of you know, just making everything slightly more efficient. Numbers. This is the important bit. So this is a, a benchmark I did a couple of weeks ago uh, on a... This is a sort of representative corpus for a, a, a client that we're working with at the moment. And they've got 22,000 queries. Um, and running it on this, so, you know, this is not the hardware, this is not server hardware, this is just a MacBook. Um, it takes about five seconds to run 22,000 big, ugly queries over an average document, yeah, which is not bad. Um, but if we put the pre-searcher on there, exactly the same thing, it'll do it in uh, a quarter of a second. So that's a 20 times 20 time speed up, which you know, if you have an SLA that says, I need to do things in a, approximately a quarter of a second, if you don't have the pre-searcher on there, then you need 20 times as many machines. So this is a, a, nice, a nice saving. Um, and looking at what it's actually doing, what the pre-searcher is actually cutting out, um, of those 22,000 queries, it's running an average of 250. Um, there's still, obviously, there's a fixed cost to, uh, to creating the, um, the disjunction query from a document that comes in. So the, uh, without the pre-searcher, or with the actual pre-searcher that says, just get, give me everything, um, give me all the queries, uh, it, it takes no time to build that disjunction query. It's not building the disjunction query, it's just running everything. With uh, the pre-searcher, it's taking, of that 0.25 seconds, um, about 50 milliseconds, between 50 and 75 milliseconds of that is actually building the query. So there's not, it's not a completely free, um, uh, there are trade-offs there. And again, you need to judge that on, you need to measure it, you need to judge it on your document set, your query set. Getting matches out, um, again, is pluggable. Um, you have something called a candidate matcher, which um, is given, so for each query that it matches, it then passes it to the candidate matcher, uh, and you can then do, um, you can run your own query, and so that you can customize how exactly you're going to run the query. So it comes, uh, Luat comes with a couple of standard ones. We've got the simple matcher, uh, which gives you a yes or a no answer. Did this match? Did this not match? You've got a scoring matcher, which will go and do the calculate the score. Now, this is this is useful in some cases. Um, just using the standards Lucene TF IDF scoring isn't actually going to help very much because you've got a single document there. So IDF is always one. Um, so it kind of depends. I mean. Um, you can create your own scoring, um, which will generally be mean sort of uh, creating your own similarities, uh, and that that will give you. Again, you have to you have to be careful about how you about relying on scoring and what you're going to do with scoring. Um, but still, it's there. If you want to use it, you can use it. Um, the the fun one is the intervals matcher because this tells you the exact hit position of everything that matches. And this is particularly useful for media monitoring, particularly when you have, you know, if you have an absolutely gigantic query and it comes up with a hit against a document that's three sentences long, it's very difficult to work out, what, particularly if that document is wrong. Um, so in media monitoring, this is normally a first pass. Uh, you, you run this, um, you've, you've got your document stream, you run these queries against it, and that'll give you a set of, of, uh, of things that it's found. But it's normally then someone will actually go through and 
by hand check that all of these things make sense uh, because you get false positives all the time. Um, and if you want to improve your, or reduce your false positive rate, you want to improve your queries, you want to refine your queries, you need to know why something has matched. Uh, and a standard highlighter, that's kind of difficult because the standard highlighter doesn't tell you exactly what's matched. It gives you a guess. It kind of says, this is what I think it might have matched, but that's often not good enough. So, there is a branch, uh, there is a JIRA open on Lucene called Lucene 2878, uh, which was largely written by this guy down the front here, Simon. Um, he did all the difficult stuff. I did some boring stuff to make it fit in with everything else. Um, and it allows you to, to determine um, the exact, exact positions of everything that has hit from, um, from a Lucene query. Um, it also uses something called uh, minimum interval semantics to efficiently run proximity queries. Um, so the first iteration of this, we were using span queries, and span queries work, but they're kind of massive. Uh, they take up enormous amounts of memory, and they're quite slow. Uh, whereas the minimum interval query ones use much less RAM, and they're much quicker. Um, I don't have actual numbers in this uh, uh, slide deck about them, but it's you know, on the order of four, time, four or five times faster and about half as much memory taken up with these particular documents and these particular queries. Um, so yeah, we have the intervals matcher, which um, runs, this, is, this runs using a fork of Lucene that I'm maintaining at the moment. Um, it will get merged into trunk at some point, really. I've been saying this for a while. <laughs> it's gonna happen. <laughs> Tonight, all right? <laughs> um, uh, so, but for the moment, this is, so if you're using LUAC, there, there are two versions of LUAC out there, one of which runs off, the, uh, off this fork that I'm maintaining, which gives you the intervals matcher, um, and another one which just runs off straight Lucene 4.8 and doesn't have any of the intervals matching goodness, but it also, it does have the simple matcher and the scoring matcher. And at some point, I'll probably try and do a highlighting matcher in there as well, so it'll run a highlighter over it, and you can use the usual Lucene highlighters in there. Um, the other thing the intervals matcher for, is useful for is actually if you're writing um, your own pre-searcher implementation, it's useful for debugging it because it, will cont it can tell you which terms in a query have matched um, uh, from, from the... So it'll tell you what, uh, what terms in the query made the pre-searcher select that particular query to run, which is very useful when you're... So uh, for things like the, the wildcards, when I was writing the, the, um, the various wildcard implementations, I was getting lots of spurious matches, and it turns out that... Uh, Basically, I turned out I'd done it horribly wrong. Um, and it wasn't obvious to me how I'd done it horribly wrong until you go and see which things it's actually matching on and say, okay, that, that term is clearly wrong. I can work out why it is that it's matching on that term. So as I said, LUAC is all pluggable. It's all um, extendable. You can um, create your own query extractors. So at the moment, it, um, it'll fall back to, if it encounters a query that it doesn't know how to get terms from, it'll fall back to running just extract terms on the query. Um, but often that doesn't make sense. So for things like range queries, um, there, we have numeric range queries uh, in a lot of the, 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 um, the queries that I'm dealing with, but they tend to be added on as filters. So I can get away with not trying to work out how to index them. I can just index them with an any token, and then the term waiter will throw that out. Um, this won't actually happen in, in all cases. Sometimes you really do need to work out how to index a numeric range filter. When I talked about this in Dublin last November, um, someone came up with a really cunning, cunning idea of how to do this. Um, unfortunately, I was on loads of painkillers at the time, and I, couldn't, I had an inner ear infection, and I couldn't hear anything. So if, if, if that was anybody here, or if anyone comes up with a good idea, please come and tell me afterwards and write it down so I don't forget it this time. Um, but you know, if you, sometimes you want to create your own custom queries, then you can create your own custom query extractor as well and say, okay, this is how I want to index this query. Um, you can actually say, I'm going to create a completely different pre-searcher implementation. I think your way of doing it is rubbish. I've got a much better idea. Um, and it's pre-searcher is just, it's two, two methods. It's index query and build. So index query for when you've got a query coming in and build query for when you're building a query from a document. You have your own idea of doing that, then you can just plug it in and everything else will work around it. Um, you can create your own matches. Uh, there's a, so the standard candidate matcher, um, again, you just have to override a particular method which says, here's a query, here's a highlight query. Um, uh, use these to do whatever you want with these and get any, any whatever information you want out. Pull requests are always welcome. 
um, particularly if it's something complicated that I don't understand, then you write it and give it to me and I'll pull it into to my library. That's, that's how open source works. Uh, yeah, and, that's, and there's the, um, the GitHub repository there. Uh, and yeah, I think I'm, I've got loads of time for questions because I kind of ran through that a little faster than I was expecting. Um, there's, that's me as well. You can contact me at Alan at Flax or I'm on Twitter at Ramsey Geek. Anybody have any questions? Thanks for the talk. If you have any questions, please wait for the microphone. Yeah, this guy over here. Thank you for your talk. One question. Are you handling not queries? And if yes, how are you doing this? So for not queries, so not queries in a Boolean, basically we just ignore them. Um, because if you think about it, a, a, a not clause is saying if this is present, then don't match it. In which case, you know, if, so if it's present in the document that's coming in, you don't want to match it, so you don't want it to hit on the, on the, the query index. So you can just ignore them. But you can imagine that is it just only I want all documents which does not contain some, I don't know. Uh, some term, probably it's a rare case, so it's... Very, okay, uh, yeah, um, but generally you'll have a, so, yeah, in which case it'll end up being run against every single document, but then you, you kind of have to run that against every single document, because every single document could conceivably match that. There's not an easy way of cutting down the, the query space for that. It's quite often you'll find, so things like uh, wildcards, if someone's got a, a asterisk, or a pref uh, prefix query of A, you think, well, okay, that's going to blow up, and that's, you know, if you're storing A in your terms index, in your query index, every single document is going to match that, which is true, but every single document is probably actually going to get hit on that query as well. So you do get pathological queries, um, which are going to slow everything down. Unfortunately, that's the nature of, of the situation, and, you know, yeah, if you have a pathological query, then there's not much you can do about it. You do have to run that against everything. Over here. Um, the question is more about um, scaling out. Um, I'm mm -hmm. not, um, if you have a huge stream of data, but a large, large throughput, you may need to um, shard that out and break that stream and send it to multiple servers. Do you, does Lout have any capability for managing queries across a number of instances? So yeah, that, that's uh, the big question is how to shard out the queries at the moment. So Luwak itself is just a library. It's not a full set, full scale solution. Um, and so we we build the, the way I normally do it is I build um, web services using Drop Wizard, to, which includes Luwak. Yeah, good, everyone, give give me some Drop Wizard love. Um, and uh, yeah, so so far all the 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 query sets we've dealt with have been sufficiently small that they will fit into RAM on a server. But yeah, I can see how yeah, in certain cases you would want to say, okay, let's split this out. Um, the simple way is to say, okay, we'll just partition it, bang down the middle, um, have these two, you know, you, you, you do something, you use a message queue uh, or something, something like that to, to split, split the document stream into two and then recombine it at the end. Um, yeah, Luwak doesn't do that out of the box. Um, if you want to do that, then you can pay me to build something for you that will do that. Or somebody else, but uh, yeah. How would you deal with geolocation queries? How would I deal with? Uh, geolocation queries, like? So yeah, so geolocation queries are kind of like, it's a generalization of numeric range query, of any kind of range query. Um, and yeah, at the moment, we've tended to ignore that. <laughs> um, primarily because these things, normally you're not saying, give me everything that's within this bounding box. You're saying, give me everything within this bounding box that also matches X. So we can kind, you can kind of say, ignore it. Okay, okay, we'll get you, give everything that matches X, and then you have to go and run, um, run all those, all those queries against it. But with, with the query sets that we've been dealing with, um, in fact, I don't think we've had to deal with anything that has a geo, uh, geotagging um, yet. 
I've got someone's talking about it at the moment. Um, and yeah, that will probably involve us having to work out how to do the, the reverse indexing of, uh, of range queries. Um, I think the idea, one possibility is to try and partition the range up and say, okay, well, we can divide that range up into buckets and index terms from these buckets um, with different levels of granularity. And then when a document comes in, you um, you should have something that will, will match one of those buckets, but it which might work, but it might not. <laughs> so obviously we need to we need to, to test that. Um, and you know, in most cases you can get away with just not indexing that, but you might find yeah, if you run a benchmark and find found that actually you're you're getting lots and lots of false hits because of that, then yeah, then it's worth putting the the, the time in to try and work out how to reverse ind to do the reversing index of that. Anybody else? I can't see because of the light. No more questions. No? Okay. Ellen, thank you very uh, thank much you. for your talk. Yes. <laughs>